Hey everybody, what's going on? So, pretty solid crowd. Um, while I have all your attention, can I get a rough feel for which of you self-identify as engineers? Awesome. So I'm gonna have a lot that'll offend both you and your non-engineering coworkers, and hopefully you'll also learn something. So, kind of the talk, I've given this talk in various settings, but um, it's generally named something like data-driven from day zero, if it's really buzzword compliant sort of place. Um, it's otherwise known as constructive laziness. Um, sorry, I was doing a check. Uh, Wrong slide deck. Wrong slide deck? Yeah. We are having slight technical difficulties, but I will ad-lib this for right now. It's all good otherwise. Um, so overall context of all this is I've watched about 40 to 50 companies over the last three years. I've been a formal advisor to about 10 of those. I've been an investor in some others. And I've generally kind of watched some very predictable pitfalls, some very predictable things that people do, and lots of ways that they manage to step on their own feet. Um, and as we wait for McKinsey. What's your favorite? What's my favorite pitfall? Um, it's called the ETL fire, fairy. Uh, it's this belief that there's this magical creature out there that will clean up all your mess for you. You won't have to pay them. You'll just like find some magic tool somewhere and magically your data is amazing. And no one had to do it. Well, duh. <laughs> or XML, if you're old enough to remember that. I'm still blacking out the 90s, but you know. <laughs> Just one moment. I think we actually have. What? what? Takes a moment to turn on. Uh, there we go. So, talk also known as constructive laziness for fun and profit, or in other words, how to hive a very highly scalable engineering team. So, we'll be going over like who I am, why I should care. Uh, talking about some traps you'll face as well as the way out. Now, just full disclosure, I'm shilling a product, so the way out is my company, but it'll still get, we'll still get some more fun. So first of all, who am I? Um, my name is Smeal Sakran. I'm currently the founder of an open source BI company called Metabase, which you should download at all times and tell your friends. Uh, previously, I was CTO of Expa, which is a local uh, micro VC incubator and accelerator. I was also CTO of Blackjet, which is a private aviation startup. Um, I've spent time running data science at uh, iMeme, which is an online music site, as well as being a data scientist at General Catalyst Partners. Um, started a couple companies, sold one, and have generally just been around the valley for a while. And I've seen some shit. Uh, many of these mistakes I've made. Others have been made under my watch. Still others have been made by folks I've been advising. And so hopefully I will share some of that with you. Um, given that this is the startup loft, I'm going to be mainly focused on early stage startups. There are a couple basic assumptions in all this. One of them is that you're fundamentally competent. You know what you're doing, you've hired well, your team's solid, your coworkers are solid, and you, you, are, you actually know what's going on. Second major assumption is you don't know what you're doing. In the sense that you don't know what, exactly what you're building, you don't have a three-year roadmap, you don't know precisely what to ship when, and fundamentally half of the problem is figuring out what exactly it is. Now this also applies to larger companies when you're spinning up projects, and in general there's lots to learn there, but for the most part I'm focusing on pre-Series A folks. 
So that's all awesome. And let's talk about the bumps you can hit on the road to your yacht. So I've broken this up into two main problems. One of them is organizational traps. So things that relate to management, things that relate to how you set up the company, things that relate to like how you as engineers do your job. Um, the other is more detailed, and we're kind of like skim through that, and if people are interested in it, I'm sure I'll gore a few sacred cows. But till then, this is just like a nice biggie. So the first and my favorite delusion, which is the magic ETL fairy. Basically, it's this belief that your data doesn't really need to be read. You have an application, you have a product, you're building it, you're building it, and at some point, somewhere, somehow, someone's going to run analytics for you. They might change it in shape, they might get data from somewhere else, they might rearrange it, but fundamentally there's magic, and someone somewhere over there is going to fix it. So this is what it looks like in real life. So most human beings have a sense for what the company does. They have a mental model of what things mean, how they're shaped. Uh, users have names, they have home addresses, they have emails, they have lifetime values. You can talk about this, you can poke it, you can prod it, you have a feel for what that all means. Now, in reality, on disk, it looks like crap. And it's very, very highly optimized crap that someone who's very intelligent spent a lot of time getting right. Unfortunately, it does not map to what a normal human being thinks of when they think about a user. And so I'm just using the word ETL here, but let's just kind of like wave our hands a little bit and say it's the process by which you transform like the data on disk to this model that corresponds to how normal human beings think about their company. Now, there's no ETL ferry. Sorry, no Easter Bunny, no ETL ferry. Santa Claus really just doesn't come down your chimney. Um, all this stuff takes time, money, and people. And fundamentally, the ETL ferry's name is a data infrastructure engineer, and they run you about 300K per year fully loaded. So unless you're going to hire a bunch of those, they don't exist. And a lot, of, a lot of the advice that I have stems from this fundamental point, which is that you have to optimize for the whole thing, and there's not this magic that cleans up data for you. So variants of this, and this, these are things you'll find yourself saying. Uh, first one is analysts will figure it out. So just throw over the wall, hire someone NoSQL, and they'll figure that out. Uh, we'll write all our own tools. That comes up a lot, and it's like, cool. So you want to do that? Rock it. Uh, chances are you'll hate life in about three months. Um, other one is like, we have an API. People can build on that API. That's really shorthand for, I promise to write it, and I won't write it in three months. Uh, so now let's switch gears to another common thing I see, I see over and over again, which is leaving instrumentation till the end. So things you'll find yourself saying, we don't have any users yet. We don't know what to measure. We're waiting on our Docker-based microservices, what not are we, but we can't actually ship it yet. So um, this is kind of the hyper-idealized view of life that you have when you're kind of in the trenches, let's say month two or three. Uh, you're developing stuff. That's awesome. Uh, at some point in the future, you're going to instrument the app. And then, of course, you're going to launch. And launch is going to be great. And you're going to grow, 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 grow. Your instrumentation that you built pre-launch is going to be complete. You'll add a little bit to it, but fundamentally, you're right. Then you IPO, and you, shop, you go yacht shopping. Now, having been around a couple of these, this is actually what it looks like. So you're going to be developing stuff all the way through. You're going to be instrumenting things over and over again, and you're never going to be exactly right. And guess what? Half the time, you don't really know what's going on. And then there's always the, like, where did this thing come from? Why did our refunds up by 30% last night? Who knows? What's this coupon code? What's going on with this account? And just variants of this go happen over and over and over again. And you kind of should expect that, and you should build your analytics to expect that. And so it's then always be measuring. I was trying to find an ABC acronym, but couldn't quite make it work, so ABM. Uh, another great thing that people tell you is like, every metric is important. Here's this list of 20 that I need. Guess what? You can't have it. Um, just pick some. So if everything's important, nothing is. The more you have to keep track of, the more confused you're going to end up being. And the other kind of elf in the room is, if there's 50 metrics you have access to, one of them is up and to the right. And so you're going to kid yourself, and you're going to like d delude yourself, and you're not going to actually sit down and be realize, oh crap, the thing I actually care about has been flat for the last six months. How do I fix that? All right, so now we're going to switch gears a little bit. And some of this will be somewhat technical, so I'm going to breeze through it depending on crowd reaction. So if you like what you're hearing, you know, be lively, say something, otherwise I'm going to blur through all of this stuff. 
So there are lots of things that early stage companies end up doing, and they end up biting them. Um, I'm going to blow through these. So test users. Chances are you're going to have a beta program. Chances are you've got invites. Chances are you've got some amount of crap in your online database, and you have to clean it up. Now, most people tell you the right way to do this is to keep a list of your, every program, have a code that corresponds to that, have a separate table that is you know, invite code per user, and then have some way to do a bunch of joins on that. And the reality is that's going to ruin life about analytics. Soft deletes are awesome until you actually have to write data, read data out. So maybe save that until you have scale problems. It's a great thing to do, but it's, it's a mis this is a mistake you should make, which is have hard deletes early on. And I'm happy to talk out why that is for someone that cares. So come on afterwards. Uh, Server-side sessionization is the devil. Please don't do it. You will hit yourself. Your users will hit your your end users internally will hit you. You'll be debugging this for the rest of your life. Sessionize on the client. Uh, abusing semi-structured data is also another perennial favorite. So if you've got the same four fields in your JSON blob, every blob, you really just have structured data. You should bite the bullet and deal with that. So. Uh, the right database for the job. So at, at certain scales, you really should be using the right thing for each thing. And you, like Google should not be running search off of a Postgres uh, text index. However, early on, every single database is yet one more place for stuff to live in one more different format with different conventions, different quirks around time zones, different quirks around IDs. J try, and, try to keep things to one single database and use that. Uh, you, you will naturally slap more on over time, but resist the temptation to do that too early. To recap, there is no ETL fair. You've got 20 databases flowing around. You've got to get in together somehow. And again, that, that's pretty expensive. Uh, this is kind of the catch-all for, for situations where you're building something, you're building something, but you really want to generalize to every conceivable thing you think of for the next couple of years. So slow it all down, ship small incremental features, and keep track of what you're measuring and measure small increments. So obviously, I've been rattling off a bunch of things you shouldn't do. So what, you should, what should you do? Uh, fundamentally, stay small, tight, and agile, like the kit. So stop pretending you know what you want to measure. Focus on making it easy for everyone to do small data pulls as you go. Uh, have an easy to use data model. So think about the people that read it. Uh, Concentrate on optimizing your analytics team for turnaround time for new events, new metrics, as opposed to just getting things right. Obviously, install Metabase today, metabase.com, or free open source BI. And then just point any application database. So from day one, point us at it, and then let your end users ask their own questions. And so as a bit of blatant self-promotion, uh, so Metabase is both free and open source. We work with 13 or 14 different databases. You can host us anywhere. Uh, people actually install us in two to five minutes. Um, there's a non-SQL interface for normal human beings that you work with uh, that lets them ask their own questions, make their own dashboards, send themselves nightly emails with partners' nightly emails. You can embed us in your application if necessary. And we also have uh, SQL and data modeling tools for pros. And then as you grow, expect to transition from that world. Because obviously, you're not going to point a BI tool at your main application database. And so at some point, you get a replica. And then at some point, when the ETL ferry starts to flit around your offices, uh, throw stuff into Redshift and use that heavily. Uh, expect your coworkers to ask you for all kinds of crap. Get used to telling them no and not yet. Um, again, there's going to be a number of things that you know to measure. There can be things that you can measure with, at great cost. And generally, having a feel for what it'll cost your organization to give people that number is really good, and just set back to them. Say, hey, cool, I can answer that, but I need to hire half a full-time engineer. Do you still want that number? Chances are they'll be like, uh, yeah, later. Um, expect organic growth. So things are messy. Things are always in flux. Uh, there's never a point at which people say, yeah, I had this nailed. It's always messy. It's always complicated. You're perpetually like pruning and trimming and moving things around, and that's just the state of the world. Um, especially as you're growing, as you're learning more about the product, as you learn more about what you're doing. Um, expect to just that whole process. So if you haven't been paying attention, the final take home is install us, metabase.com. 
you would be glad you did. Tell your friends. Um, and so why? Let's see if this works. Nope, never mind. So Q&A, anyone who's curious or offended, bring it on. Um, that's a very complicated question. My glib answer is yes. My not so glib answer is figure out what you do want to do with your events. So depending on your access patterns and how fast you want stuff to come back, um, S3 can work at certain scales, but you're eating a lot of latency. And so in general, there are different tiers of latency for analytics. So anything that's sub-second, people use all the time. Things that get into like 30 to 60 seconds are annoying. Anything that's north of a minute, people just don't really use unless they have to. And so, you know, in some ways, putting, your, putting all your events onto a very high latency storage engine is shorthand for we don't want to have lots of people use it. So we generally find people are really, really happy with Druid, really, really happy with Crate. Uh, they're happy with like highly customized Redshift instances. If it's on S3 and Hive, then fundamentally the only people who use it are analysts. And while they do get value from it, it's not the same kind of world where everyone in your company just gets your questions answered like that. Uh, Athena? Yeah, uh, so it's Presto under the hood. Uh, so I, I mean, unclear. I have not seen it. It's been out for a couple months. But in general, there is a... You know, Presto gets to several seconds, so if you like get things nailed down right, you can actually get into something resembling interactive speeds. Um, it does take a bit of foresight and a bit of like planning out what you want to do with it. So things like cohort analysis, things like funnels, there's stuff where it's like a self-join, and then you have like note, cross node, cross talk, and it's not going to be sub-second. What's up? So we don't yet support Dynamo, per se. Um, and in general, the question is not so much like how fast the individual act, like, reads are. It's what happens when you want to ask a question that goes across like 10 terabytes. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and you know, N not just that, that's kind of one part of it, but it's also the shift from looking at things from a transactional, like rights per second sort of world to I want to scan through uh, 10 terabytes here, join it with 20 or 40 terabytes there, re you know, do a self-join, and then figure out who came back for the shopping cart. And there's lots of things that are really valuable that involve just either massive table scans or worse yet, table scans or self-joins. Well, that's the place you don't want to do big data, you want to do smart. Yeah. Agile data, if you will. Anybody else got any thoughts, questions, death threats? <laughs> all right, well, thank you all for listening and I appreciate taking the time. <laughs>